Okay, so this is class number nine, the pre-class video for Monday, July 11th. And the topic is humanism, the history of humanism, and the fact that the United States of America was founded by humanists. So I'm going to start out with a quote from 2004, a, um, where D David Susskind did an interview at the White House, and a White House aide talked to him. And he was, Susskind was trying to get the facts about um, something going on, right, in Washington with the president, which journalists are, I think, always trying to get the facts, or they should be. So this um, White House aide said um, that guys like me, quote, were, were, quote, in what we call the reality-based community, which he defined as people who, quote, believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I nodded and murmured something about the enlightenment principles and empiricism. He cut me off. That's not the way the world really works anymore, he continued. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously, as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left just to study what we do. So that was 18 years ago. And I think people agree at this point that there is disinformation, and there are, there is a lot of manipulation going on for the purposes of, of power creating an empire, gaining power by denying the facts or distorting the facts. So uh, just FYI that it's, it didn't start yesterday. It didn't start however you, whatever you think is the starting point, that at some other time before that, um, reality was not distorted for the sake of power. Now, it you could say it's on steroids now. It's a lot more intense and more in-depth and uh, complex than it used to be. But still, um, it's always been that case. And if you remember in one of the newspaper articles from one of the first days of class, uh, Richard Nixon decided, someone who was running Nixon's campaign decided that he's going to run it just like selling uh, Wheaties or Cheerios, you know, you're just going to make the president into a com commercial product and sell them the way you would sell any other commercial project product and you wouldn't talk about issues, what these people, what you actually pay them to do. So I would suggest you figure out what the people do for a living if they get elected. And then it, do they have a CV that fits what the actual job is? So that's what you need to do. You're hiring someone for a job. Because I can tell you, there's a lot of disinformation. Um, but one of those pieces of disinformation is that our founders were somehow conservative Christians and they were not conservative Christians, <laughs> whatever else they were. They maybe were Christians, but they were not conservative Christians. 
So, um, so I want to, this is the outline of the article. I did have you read 26 pages, but the first, the beginning, and I'm just, these are the points that I picked out that I had students get into groups and talk about. But the first one, again, is something I'm always emphasizing, that philosophy is important uh, because, partly because of what it talks about, the expression of the need to find significance and meaning in life and to integrate our lives around a clear, consistent and compelling view of human existence and how to solve our problems. So I think you know by now that that's critical. Should we use reason alone to solve our problems? Should we use faith alone? Or should we use a union of reason and faith? And it makes a lot of difference in how people address events in front of their face, right? What happens, how you interpret it, what the cause is, affects what are you going to do about it? Are you going to try to fix it? Um, so I think this is critical. Next thing is everyone does adhere to a philosophy, even if they're not aware of it. That's why I want you to take this process seriously of developing your worldview. Um, it, the philosophers include nature, human nature, and society. They try to integrate all the dis disciplines. They combine theory and practice, so you try to live out your beliefs. Um, and in the Western tradition, the two great martyrs were Jesus and Socrates. So, um, and the quote here in the book, the philosophy best calculated to liberate the creative energies of humankind and to serve as a common bond between the different people of the earth is the way of life more, most precisely described as humanism. So this doesn't mean it's anti-Christian. It just means if you're a Christian, you need to be a Christian humanist. Um, all right. So the underlying science of it, well, let's see, Thomas Jefferson was, um, the author of the Declaration of Independence, he was actually a Unitarian. He did not believe in the Trinity. He did not believe Jesus was God incarnated. Um, and he wanted the Declaration of Independence to be to the world, the signal of arousing human beings to burst the chains under which the monkish ignorance and superstition, that would be, you could say Catholic, but you could also say Christian. Uh, you could just say, or you could say religion has persuaded them to bind themselves and to assume the blessings and security of self-government. So they, he did reject conservative Catholicism, not any old kind of Catholicism there. I, have friends that are liberal Catholics that I really like, and I and I go and live with them in the summer. So um, it's just there are branches of religion that hold us back, and you already know that from studying sexism, racism, uh, discrimination against non-binary uh, people. So. Religion can be a hindrance to progress and also to block everybody's natural drive to have a life of rational liberty, of being free to make their choices, basing them on reason and some idea of flourishing or faith. All right, Abraham Lincoln said the goal of liberty um, is that so everyone should have an equal chance. Of course, I mean, this is all uh, tainted by the way that he applied this principle. <laughs> he made other racist comments. Um, I don't, you know, 
he was not as progressive, let's put it that way, as people are today. So he was progressive in his day, but uh, history moves forward. Our consciousness changes. So Lyon students, I think it's very ironic that Lyon students who call themselves conservative are more liberal. <laughs> They're in faith. They just assume sexual equality is a conservative principle. No, it's not. <laughs> and the conservatives fought against uh, sexual equality for as long as they possibly could until they figured out they couldn't get any more votes for being against it. So they were for it. Um, but you just have to remember, you know, that history is moving forward. What's conservative in one generation is liberal in the next generation and vice versa. And you're part of that process. You're part of working out not only a personal worldview, a collective worldview and leading your generation forward. So you do need to have some idea of where is forward how do I want to lead? The preamble to the Constitution is a summary of humanist purposes. Both the preamble and the Constitution leave out all mention of God, which was really, really left wing radical at the time. Got incredibly criticized for being atheists. Um, there are different kinds of humanism, Renaissance humanism rejected the otherworldliness of medieval Christianity, um, and it focused on human flourishing, okay? Um, rejected the Catholic Church, the religious limitation on knowledge, returned to the Greeks and Romans. This wasn't really fair against the Catholic Church because Thomas Aquinas in 1250 integrated Aristotle into the Catholic Church. But what happens is the people leading the Catholic Church had become anti-pagan, even though the theology included a lot of paganism. Um, very ironic. Um, so eventually that return to the classics led to a rejection of modern science. So humanism went in a different direction. Okay, so in this class, I use Aristotle, that would be the classics, but in a way that doesn't require you to reject modern science. At that time in history, it was set up as an either or, but today it doesn't have to be. Also, you need to know that I have my own sweetened, condensed version of Aristotle's virtues because there's one of them about being a proud man, which is clearly, I can't, it really is sexist, racist, uh, not, not <coughs> what any of us today would want. So I just skip that part. Um, all right, so ah, a rejection of the ancient classics didn't necessarily mean a rejection of the virtues. So then we have the Humanist Manifesto from 1933. And what I wanted you to, to look at was how it's changed over time. So in 1933, this was radical, right? This position was considered radical. Religion can be dogmatic and anti-scientific, but it should not be. So their manifesto includes religion. We need a new statement of religion and religious humanism. Religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing, not created. But humans are a part of nature and have emerged as a result of a process. There's no split between nature and humanity. Religious culture is the product of humankind's gradual development. Modern science leads to the rejection of any supernatural or cosmic guarantees of human values. 
Values have to be determined through intelligent inquiry. Religion has to formulate its hopes and plans in the light of the scientific spirit and method. The humanists reject the theism, deism, modernism, and other kinds of new thought. So you can tell that every generation has new, new thought, right? And then sometimes uh, it starts to, this process from new to the next wave of new, you see kind of patterns. And so they, they could also be understood as variations on a theme. We keep coming back to some of the same stuff, but we wrap it in different wrapping paper. Uh, and that's up to you to decide if you think it's fundamentally different or just uh, a different name for the same thing or just a modified version um, that we are making progress in our humanism. Um, even if you decide to choose religious humanism, um, the, I, the kind of religious humanism you should have is the goal of life is the complete realization of the human personality. We need to replace old attitudes in worship and prayer with a sense of well-being and the desire to help others and improve society. Um, so, I mean, who could disagree with that? <laughs> what, what religious person would disagree with? We need to work hard to make the world a better place, right? We need to desire and act on our desire to help other people, but it doesn't have a supernatural cause. You aren't doing it to look good in the eyes of God or to get to heaven. You're doing it because it's just the right thing to do. Um, you should foster creativity. You should foster knowledge accumulation. You should always try to develop human life. And this view is very critical of a society that's driven mostly by profit and acquisition. It says we need a radical change in methods, controls, and motives for social interaction because we need a socialized and cooperative economic order. And this is a huge problem today. What is driving our economic order? Is it just profit or is it a cooperative venture concerned with the quality of life? Humanism affirms life rather than it denies it. It encourages possibilities and aims for a satisfactory life for everyone. Okay. Then there's the next Humanist Manifesto, 1973. This is when I was in college, actually. So now you have the rise of technology. So you see how humanism sort of adapts to the latest trends. The technology provides for the possibility for good or evil. Um, if it's dedicated to human well-being, great. But if it leads to ecological damage, overpopulation, dehumanizing institutions, totalitarian repression, nuclear and biochemical disaster, well, what do you think has happened, right? So when I was in college, I was very aware of environmental issues. And I knew if we don't tackle these issues, we're going to be in big trouble in 50 years. Um, actually, we were in big trouble in 30 years. But anyway, we haven't addressed it. And we are in big trouble. Also overpopulation. I thought about how many kids I wanted to have because of overpopulation is a serious problem. People do not think about it anymore. Over half of the countries in the world are trying to get women to have more babies. They're providing incentives. And that's because that is how you grow the economy. But you, without even considering the natural resources available, 
for more and more people? Yeah, that's the way a lot of economists work that way. They call environmental impacts externality, externalities. They don't factor in on the cost of creating something. They just don't factor in on the economic policies at all. Um, okay, in the manifesto that you don't want apocalyptic prophecies and doomsday scenarios. So yeah, an environmentalist, a climate change person could turn into like a flaming prophet or somebody predicting the end of the world, but they don't think it's like God's plan or Jesus is going to come again. They think it's an abuse of our human capacities to create technology and other tools that have led to the destruction of the earth. Um, and they would advocate using science and reason to create a constructive social and moral order. This is very important because there are people who think that that is arrogant, right? Uh, using science to make a better life is arrogant. Well, then of course, we're not gonna do it, obviously. Um, religion can inspire dedication to the highest ideals but traditional and authoritarian religion re reject science. Um, so the United States, one of the things that made it great was that it was pro-science until recently, um, or at least people came for economic prosperity. And in the process of becoming more economically prosperous, they used science and technology to create products that people would buy. Um, okay, we need a new view of religion. Um, promises of salvation are not helpful and they're not true. Okay, well, you might say, someone might say, well, how do you know that they're not true? And then someone might say, well, okay, all I care about is whether they're harmful. They're preventing people from focusing on our concerns of the day and fixing our problems. Um, some types of political ideology, whether they're capitalist or communist, function in the same way as harmful religious dogma. So if you have this dogma that, you know, you got to be a religious, uh, you should be motivated by the desire to get saved, right? Turn away from this world. Okay, so that's one kind of dogma that's very harmful. Uh, it doesn't help anybody. Another kind of dogma is the free market is always good. It's God's plan because God wants us to be free and to freely choose how to live our lives. And only capitalism provides that freedom. On the other hand, um, the reason why there were communist movements is because if you just have capitalism without regulating it, money sticks to money, there's no middle class, then you get social unrest, and then you get communist revolutions. Um, so communism is, but communism becomes its own dogma because it was so anti-capitalism and so anti-competition uh, in the market that they ended up with a very stagnated economy and very authoritarian leaders. So that is also very harmful. Um, then there is a social culture. Oh, here's part two, nothing human uh, is alien to the religious. So religious people should also be affirming uh, humanity. Okay. All right. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. So this again is what uh, is related to the capacities. I did, we did have this declaration as an attachment in an earlier class. So right to born free and equal, uh, no discrimination, 
all this stuff. So you can think about whether you agree with these things and whether there's any point at which you think, wait a sec, it switched, because it does. <laughs> it switches from pretty radical focus on the individual to a focus on community, um, economic, social, and cultural rights. All right, the right to work, the right to good conditions of work. So um, where there's no right to work in capitalism, right? You gotta get your own jobs, but the conditions of work and equal, the conditions of work. So there are laws for occupational safety and hazard. You can't put any worker in a, in a dangerous, any kind of situation you want to and just tell them they get fired if they don't put up with it. So that's a sense in which um, capitalism becomes more socialist. <laughs> Technically speaking, if you want completely free market capitalism, you have no minimum wage. You have no documents, right? Undocumented workers. Well, that's government intervention in the market. Workers should be able to go wherever they want, all over the planet. There should not be any um, laws. <coughs> There's no laws for equal pay for equal work. All of this is socialism. These are interventions on the market. So keep that in mind next time you start talking about socialism versus capitalism. There's no right to rest and leisure in a capitalist um, society. There's no right to a decent standard of living or healthcare, none of this. This is all socialism. Right to education is socialism. Just because our country has it doesn't mean it's not socialist. Um, we just have a regulated capitalism system um, where the Europeans call it democratic socialism. We would probably um, call it, I don't know, social, socialized capitalist, socialized capitalism or something like that. Um, okay. Then there's the United Nations capabilities approach again. Aristotle's virtues, once again. Aristotle's political virtues. So I put all that stuff at the end so that you can compare humanism to these other, um, these other systems or the other frameworks that I've presented. So that's the main point for Monday's class is for you to think about humanism. Let me give you one other um, Thing I, I want you to look at this particular uh, page in the book because it's the background and affiliations of the humanist philosophy. And our founders, I'm telling you, our founders attracted all of these free thinkers from Europe, all these way out liberals who were getting persecuted in England. They knew they could come to America and just be free thinkers. They set up their little utopian communities. They set up their little Christian utopian communities. It was really, you know, sort of whatever you want, whatever floats your boat. Um, there was no discrimination, or there wasn't supposed to be, of course, um, based on just religious belief. That was the separation of church and state. Um, now, someone like Locke thought, and Locke was the grandfather of our founders, thought that you, you can't have atheists in civil society because you can't trust them to tell the truth. Now, is that fair? <laughs> if you're an atheist, you know, you're not going to swear on the Bible, so you might not tell the truth. But any old Christian, you know, they'll swear in the Bible and they will definitely never lie in court. <laughs> okay, so there was a bias against secular humanism. It wasn't based on facts. It was a prejudice. Um, but anyway, so 
all these free thinkers, humanists came over from England. Also, all these really nutcake religious sects that really split reason from faith because the dominant tradition was Episcopalian. It did not split reason from faith. So you have all these other radical uh, off the wall religions that completely split reason and faith. So you got them over there and then the humanist tradition that completely rejects religion. You got all this stuff, but that was kind of what made America great was that people didn't argue about that stuff. They just got up in the morning, worked hard, became prosperous, and you think your thing and I'll think my thing. Um, and, and you didn't have politicians, I don't think, as far as I know, appealing to God all the time. That was part of a strategy, as the advisor, White House counselor said, to build an empire. Now, why would that kind of religion tied to a, we are a Christian nation, um, why would that lead to empire building? You can talk about that in class. So we have the free thought, rationalist and ethical culture movements, try to create an ethical culture. And that the reason I use the Aristotelian virtues is yeah, that's what he means by ethical. It's not the only thing he means. They also liked Confucius Analects. They like other documents of lists of virtues. There's not only one. Um, ethical contributions from various religions and philosophies. Then you have the philosophy of naturalism. Then you have the sciences and scientific method democracy and civil liberties. All these things are important and these little branches emphasize different parts. They're all part of the humanist tradition, but these are different branches. The philosophy of materialism, um, Renaissance humanism and literature and the arts. So on literature and the arts, the idea is you really educate people's emotions and their spiritual lives, which simply means living for the sake of something greater than yourself. You do that through the arts and literature. Renaissance humanism was a rejection of the Catholic monks in favor of the pagans, the classicists. But they became conservative because they became against modern science per se. Then the philosophy of materialism is reductionist. That would be what you see is what you get. Whereas a spiritual humanism is, you have to have a vision forward and then you move forward in a very concrete way, but it's driven by some idea of the good, the good life. So just to give you a picture, I, I wish all of you would read a, at least one book about humanism, because it if you don't, and you hear that word being bantered about, I can guarantee you, I mean, it's very likely that the reason is um, there's a political motive there and it's not likely to be very accurate. Uh, okay, so I think that's enough. Um, so that's what we're gonna do next time. I also have, once again, the anti, the race, John Stuart Mill's issues on race and on homosexuality. But those are both humanist, uh, adjustments to our system. So the people who led the way for women's equalities were humanists. They, again, you can be a Christian humanist, but you don't have to be. <laughs> and then the same with race and the same with sexual orientation. So we're very much in the middle of a culture that's highly affected by the Christian tradition and by the 
Greek tradition and by the humanist tradition and the way these things get mixed together, which I want you, each of you to work that out for yourself. But I do think you should know <laughs> our founders were left-wing Christians at best and Unitarian, and, you know, they were not conservative at all. All right, so that's enough for now. <laughs>